All right, now let's dig into the Big 12, another great conference here. This is a very big conference preview, if you haven't noticed, Steve, not only by the names, but by the depth of these teams, the depth of these conferences. We're going to see a multiple number of teams in the Big 12 in the NCAA tournament. The preseason top 25 mentioned five teams out of the Big 12. We're going to talk about four of those teams. We left one out. Sorry, Texas Longhorn fans. We don't. It's not that we don't believe in you. We're just going to talk about five other teams in this conversation. We're really going to throw a sleeper at you. They are in the top 25. We do think they have a really good chance at it. But we're going to start off with one of the teams that is tied for fifth with their conference mate. Now, which one do we pick for first tie? We're going to start with Kansas. Kansas, obviously, the national champion going in, is tied for fifth in preseason polls with their conference mate, Baylor. Kansas Jayhawks. I mean, what is there to say about this team? Really, the roster's a work in progress right now. But Bill Seth, I mean, Bill Self is one of the best coaches in the game. They bring in some pretty decent five-star recruits that are probably going to be starters right off the bat. Grady Dick, Ernest Uday. And then you bring in guys and you know, return guys like Jalen Wilson, Kevin McCuller. This team is going to be right back in it. And there's a reason that they're preseason ranked tied for fifth. It's hard to say that these aren't one of the front runners for the Big 12, a conference that is super deep, Steve. I, I, I mean, one to 10, top to bottom, the Big 12 is the best conference in the nation. It doesn't necessarily, I'm not saying they have the best team, though you can certainly argue that the first two teams we talk about are Final Four possibilities absolutely i find it ironic when we talk about kansas because as excited as college football fans got about finally being able that work the kansas jayhawks are relevant for the first time since i don't know gail sayers in the 60s I'm, I'm sure they were good in between that it just didn't seem that way as excited as we were about that secretly i i just laugh at tournament time and you get in these conversations about brackets Everybody wants to trash Kansas. Oh, they're soft. Oh, they're not going to make it. You know, and there were times in the late '80s, early '90s, even when the, you know when they when they were really really good, they seemed to fall short of expectations. But they really haven't disappointed in a long, long time. So, uh, if people want to dismiss Kansas, okay, okay. I hate to break it to you, you're going to be seeing them, you know, at least in the Elite Eight for sure. You know, so you might as well just get on board now and, you know, embrace it. I love McCuller. Smothering defender. I mean, I mean, he he just you can't beat him off the ball. He's he's just terrific. He's an underrated shooter. And we talk about this a lot when we, when we pre do the previews. Mm -hmm. Some players just make incremental improvements. He's the kind of guy that's going to make that kind of improvement. Uh, I think Dewan Harris is probably going to get the most calls to start, you know, alongside of him. Bill Self knows, and the great thing about Bill Self, he's not, he's not, he's not going to force a system uh, onto the talent that he has. He can coach in just about any system. You want to run up and down. He, he can do it. You want you want to slow things down, play a more defensive game, which a lot of teams try to do against Kansas because they're they're just so uber talented all the time. He can adapt to that. So Kansas is built to play whatever game their opponents want, want want them to play. So that's where you have to take Kansas seriously. A lot of the teams we're going to talk about today might seem more flashy. And we're not talking about Texas. Texas has flash, has oomph. I think that's why people are so high on them. But Kansas just gets the job done. And this roster, despite the turnover, this roster is going to get it done from day one to the end of the Big 12 Conference Tournament. And then when you get to the NCAAs, we'll see what happens. McCuller, Wilson, and Hell, even Clements seems like they're going to be a lot more capable than they were last year to bring more. My question is, which one will stand out to be the number one option? I think Wilson is probably that answer initially right off the bat. If I'm if I had to give you an answer, but I think McCuller could be that guy. 
The coolest thing about Bill Self, I think one of the, the biggest things when you try to count out Kansas, in his 19 seasons, he has not had a record finishing any lower than 17th in 19 years. That is absolutely incredible for Bill Self. This Kansas team, don't sleep on them. We're going to figure out what kind of team they are right off the bat if they're a national championship contender when they take on Duke, the third game of the year in the State Farm Champions Classic. They're also going to face teams in December like Indiana, Oklahoma State, Seton Hall. We're going to see some pretty fun games out of Kansas. We should have a good idea by the end of the year what this team looks like. Obviously, when conference play happens, just like any other conference, but especially in the Big 12, anything can happen. I'm very excited for this Kansas team. But I will say I am not as confident in Kansas this year compared to other years. And not it's not because of them; it's because of the rest of the strength in this conference. Conference. There's a reason why that they are tied for fifth in their preseason rankings with another conference mate, and that's where I want to swing to next, and that's the Baylor Bears. The Baylor Bears have been one of those teams that you really need to pay attention to. I think they have some of the most proven big men in, like. I think all of college basketball, they have a very experienced backcourt. There's just a lot to really like about this team, Steve. I think that there are some really fun t- players to pay attention to. I think they have depth off the bench. I think they have a good starting five. When I talk about this team, I seem a little more excited and a little more hopeful for Baylor than I do Kansas. And, and it's understandable. I mean, again, these guys, you know, suffered – I don't know that I've ever seen a college basketball team, a top 10 college basketball team, suffer as many critical injuries, not only in the preseason, but it just seemed like every other week, another big contributor, another big piece was getting hurt and was going to either miss games or miss the rest of the season. I, I can see where people would be a little bit hesitant. And I think in my mind, I still have that doubt. Are these guys going to come back, the guys that are returning, going to come back from these injuries and return to the form that brought a national championship team not that long ago there? Or is this going to be a roster where you, that maybe those injuries linger a little bit? Maybe it slows them down just enough that considering the increased uh, volume of talent in the Big 12 now, from top to bottom, does that kind of taint what they what they can do on the floor? I I don't know yet. I think just as we have to really see, it ha- will Kansas be able to adapt, you know, and replace the, the the team, the guys that left? Can Baylor stay healthy, and can they realize the tremendous potential? on this roster. They have a lot to rely on initially right off the bat with some unproven's at least for Baylor in the aspect. Keontae George coming in, five-star recruit. There's thoughts that he might start initially right off the bat. If he's not ready, there could be maybe Dantuan Grimes coming in. He's a JUCO transfer averaging 14 points a game. You also got a, a BYU transfer in Caleb Lohner who could be really good and then of course I know you know Speaking of that hat you're wearing, Jalen Bridges coming over from West Virginia. He's going to probably start. We'll probably see him up there averaging eight and a half points a game. I think he's going to actually do really well for Baylor this year. That's someone to pay attention to. But, of course, LJ Cryer is the guy that is going to take Baylor to wherever they go. If they go to the Big 12 championship, if they go to the Final Four, Elite Eight, whatever, it's going to be on the back of LJ Cryer. There's no doubt about that one. And, okay, Sing it with me, people. Backcourt, backcourt, backcourt. This is the best backcourt in the nation, period. I think the Iowa backcourt can challenge them over time. We were talking about it earlier in the show when we talked to Big Ten, but right now, they are the best backcourt in college basketball. There's no one close. I don't want to hear about, you know, all of these young kids, can they can do that. I don't want to hear it. This is the best backcourt in college basketball that makes Baylor a top five team. Adam Flagler, perfect compliment to Cryer. I mean, I mean, they just play off each other's skill sets so well as that backcourt goes. 
so goes Baylor. And if they maintain that status of being the best backcourt in the nation, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know we're already in, already into four conferences, and I think we've talked about a Final Four team. Now this would be a third time that I would have said this, so I'm already saying that Creighton in Iowa and Baylor or a final four team, it's the, it's the guard play. And yeah. they have reserves that if they need to rest these guys or they need, or an injury does occur, I think they have guys with enough talent that they can fill those minutes that might be lost to injury or fatigue and Baylor. The only thing that's going to prevent Baylor from going far is health. And let's hope it is not the hellish year that they went through last year. I'm with you. No, and hopefully that's not the case either because we need uh, a healthy Baylor to have a good Big 12, a fun conference, and as you said, a potential Final Four team. They do have what it takes to get there. Looking at Baylor, they start off the season uh, with a game, four games in against Virginia in the main event. They also take on Marquette in the Big East Big 12 battle. That's what their month of November really tough games look like. And some big games in December, they start off the month against Gonzaga in Spokane. And then they play Washington State in the Pac-12 Coast to Coast Challenge and end the year at Iowa State. So a couple tough games to start off 2022 heading into the new year. I don't know if we're going to really get a full snapshot of what Baylor looks like after these these basketball games, I think we might have a decent idea, but nothing in comparison to probably Kansas. I think we'll probably have a better idea of what Kansas looks like rather than Baylor. We're really going to see, honestly, just like you said, if Baylor can stay healthy through November and December, that's probably the biggest thing, not the uh, the strength of the schedule in this one. Obviously, if they you know, lay an egg, that's a different, different story. But if they can be healthy through the 12 games of 2022, that's a big, big sign. You know, I'm not usually a big fan of college basketball squads playing in international tournaments in the offseason. I think it was important for them to go to Canada to play in that tournament. I, Flagler and Cryer didn't play much, uh, but a lot of their their younger recruits and people that, that transferred in did get valuable playing time in that system. I think has should really assure any doubters about Baylor that they have the talent and the depth to overcome the injuries. Not that they had a bad roster last year, but I don't know that they really had the time tested players that going into that international tournament in, in the off season, making that trip. I think that's really put out of people's minds or it should, whether Baylor is good enough, even with an injury or two, to make a deep run. Yeah, absolutely. All right, speaking of a team that really needs to figure out their identity, that's the Texas Tech Red Rainers. They are a completely new team. And that probably the biggest task for them right off the bat is getting the key parts to play together early and have uh, good cohesion. When you look at this predicted starting five, you have four transfers on there, but the exception of Kevin O'Bonner who is arguably probably going to be the best player on this team, averages about 10 points a game, five and a half rebounds. But then you look at a guy like Fardaz Am- Amquad. I'm going to mess that up. I, I believe it's, I believe it's M week. I believe is how it's pronounced, but M week. Um... Fardaz M week, who obviously coming over from UVSU 19 points a game, 13.6 rebounds a game. This guy can really shine six eleven. They obviously have a great backcourt. What is the thoughts of this team? We have them as a first four right now. They are ranked in the preseason top 25. What are your thoughts of the Red Raiders? Can they get it all together? Can they push it all together? Can they make it happen? Well, this is the second consecutive year that Mark Adams has had to face these questions. I think Texas Tech acquitted themselves very, very well last year. In fact, I I, I was going to wear my Texas Tech shirt for this part of this podcast, but I didn't want to take away from my Mountaineer. So ah. I, so, so I, I, I kept, I'm, I'm like shrinking down so you can't see the logo on this shirt. He did it once. The team did it once. They came together as a team last year with all the doubts of all the transfers out and all the graduations. I see no reason why they're going to lose a step again this year. The fact that Kansas and Baylor 
are ahead of them does not detract from the talent that's on this Texas Tech roster. I'm weak. This is not the Mac. The Big 12 is not the WAC. So I, I think there can be some doubts there, but you can't hear that many positive scouting reports from people that, I mean, watch and break down or, and more versed than you and I are about the ins and outs and the footwork and the paint and things like that. You know, I mean, we're, we're college basketball fans. We more focus on, boy, what a fun team this is to watch or what this could happen. We know we're not into the, the, the techniques and all of that, but yeah. universally, universally, they said you know, this guy was obviously a man among boys in a, in a, really an iffy conference in the WAC. No offense, WAC fans, but it's not like you have even one terrific team in the WAC over the last couple of years. So if he shone and dominated to that point, he didn't even play a lot of minutes because he didn't have to. He was just so dominant. Right. Uh, I mean, you have to be excited for that. But I don't think we're really going to know what Texas Tech is really until league play begins, because this team is going to need November and December to come together and find out. They have to be able to trust their teammates. And when you have this kind of turnover, we've kind of glossed it over a lot, you know, in our preview so far. But when you're having the kind of turnover that Texas Tech is facing, you have to have trust on the basketball court. Now, mm-hmm. I mean, I loved playing basketball and, and I'm very short, but I was like tiny, you know, when I was like a teenager and, you know, and, and, and a youngster, people didn't have a lot of faith in me. <laughs> okay. When you're sitting at five, three and really couldn't dribble or shoot very well, you know, so it, 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 your teammates, you can just sense, Oh God, he's open. I know we got to get him the ball, but this is a bad idea. <laughs> and, and and that and that extends it through every level. Even in the in the playground, you know it's like, ah, oh, I know we really should pass to this guy at least once, but you really don't want to. Every team is going to experience that to some degree here. I think they're with M Week, I think they're they're gonna challenge him. And if we mispronounced your name, guy, I I apologize. But I believe that's the pronunciation that I have heard most often in other podcasts. And odds are all the other podcasters are mispronouncing it as well. And we'll, we'll eventually find out how it how it's supposed to be produced. So you know, so maybe I mean I mean they're going to try to bully him, mm-hmm. you know, and and you know their schedule is going to allow them to a certain degree to make those adjustments. So once conference play begins, I think we'll see Texas Tech show its metal. But don't get down early on them and say, oh, see, there's too much turnover. Mark Adams knows what he's doing. He's, a, he's, he's an underrated coach. He's been through this war already. He's going to probably continue to be through this war and have to depend on the transfer portal from smaller schools and the junior college route. That's how Texas Tech is going to build a system because they're not Kansas and they're not Baylor. They have to go that route in order to build a roster. And I think Mark Adams is the ideal guy that can uh, make uh, adjustments on the fly and get the most of his team. I'm with you. Yeah. Speaking of, you probably won't see exactly what Texas tech looks like till they hit conference play. They really don't have any huge games with the exception of being in the Maui invitational at the end of November, when they do face off against Creighton. That's obviously a big game. They'll probably be the biggest test we see until they take on then they start conference play towards the end of the year and beginning at 23. The rest of the games are games that they can obviously take care of. All right, let's move on to our next team, and we want to talk about Iowa State, the Cyclones here. This is a team that's not in the AP Top 25, but we think this is a team that could be one of the fun turnarounds, one of the fun teams that are really fun to look at. This is a rebuilt roster all over again, bringing some of uh, my good friends from St. Bonaventure. If you've heard from our past podcast, that's some of my roots as well. Um, Jaron Holmes, Ozun Ozuni. I mean, these guys are super fun to watch, and they are going to be guys that we you should be paying attention to, especially Ozun. Ozun is going to be very fun, averaging 11.3 points per game, 7.5 rebounds. I mean, he's good. Don't get me wrong. He's good. I'm excited to see what he does in the Big 12 at that level. Watching him in the A-10 for the past few years, I mean, it's going to be heartbreaking to not see him 
in brown for the Bonnies, but it's going to be cool to see him in red and yellow for Iowa State. I'm looking forward to that one. But they're not the only transfers. you got a Temple guard in Jeremiah Williams, who should be pretty decent as well. He can facilitate the ball, average almost five assists per game. That's something that's actually going to be absolutely huge for some of these transfers. And then got some decent ones coming off the bench in Hanson Ward from VCU, another Atlantic 10 transfer coming over. And then from Eastern Kentucky, Trey King. Uh, who was with Eastern Kentucky in 2020. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, so maybe a, a year off might, is that a good thing, a bad thing? We'll see what happens in that aspect. Ozune's going to be the big guy to look for. And also I think Jared Holmes, who also was a guy for St. Bonaventure, those are going to be your two stars, which I'm not even being biased. I think they're no, really no. going to shine for the Cyclones this year. Coming from a team like St. Bonaventure, who was in the preseason ranked top 25 last season, they really got... They got beat up with all their transfers and most of them coming to the Cyclones. And we, and again, you know, you and I watch a lot of Atlantic 10 basketball. Those two guys played better against better competition. It's not that they were lollygagging or, or just saying, ah, oh, well, you know, I can take the night off. I mean, they always played hard and they were always productive, but the tougher the opponent, the better they played. I want to mention a, a different King and that's Eli King coming in on this recruiting class. He was Mr. Minnesota basketball player reports on him. Really, really shining. Okay. He, he could be a star almost right away. If he does indeed step in and uh, produce at even the good level with the transfers that are already there. Uh, you talked about Williams. Iowa State could surprise people. And there's a lot of cynicism because they went from two wins to 22 wins. They're like, well, you just can't right. duplicate it, especially when you had to turn over the roster. This is what college basketball has become, is roster turnover and roster management you know from one season to the other, okay, we need to get the most out of these guys we have now. We have a pretty good idea because it's not like unhappy players keep it to themselves and surprise you. I mean, it happens sometimes. You're like, well, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. But the coach has a pretty good idea from practice. This guy's probably not going to be around next year. So you're already, when, you, when you're sending your staff out on recruiting trips, you're already saying, hey, look, we're going to need to replace you know, our two guard or we're going to need to get another center or whatever it might be. So co the good college programs and the good college staffs, and it's important to have a good staff, not just, I mean, a great coach takes you a long time, but look at any of the great programs. They have depth in their coaching staff, as well as depth on their roster. So I think that Iowa State and Olsenberg, he knows what his challenge are, is are. Right. I think he likes the fact that people want to dismiss it, saying, oh, gee, it was a fluke what happened last year. I, I, I don't think anything that happened last year indicated it was a fluke. It indicated we had a good coach, with a good system who is flexible and that breeds success. His players were competent. His players never got nervous in big games or in close games down the stretch. Everything was under control. And I think that's why Iowa state is a more interesting team to look at as potentially being in the top four, as opposed to uh, Texas or Oklahoma state where some of the other great teams, again, it's it's the Big 12, but there's 10 teams in the Big 12. But top to bottom, there is no better college basketball conference in the nation. There just is not. And if you want to argue that or send your, you know, send your questions in, we'd love to have the conversations going. <laughs> but yeah. but honestly, this is one statement, and I'm going to say a lot of really stupid things over the course of the college basketball season, but this is one statement I have a hundred percent confidence in. This is the best top to bottom basketball conference in the nation. Yeah, I think nine teams could really compete in this conference. The only team that I'd say that might not stand a chance is probably outside looking at is Kansas State. I know your West Virginia team, they're really excited about it. We're going to talk about them. 
in a couple episodes when we get to the best of the rest and talk about you know the, the the plethora of other teams we're not covering in these conferences. But speaking of Iowa State, I mean Alzenberger, I mean what the what a turnaround he had last year in his first year as coach. I mean, other than you know Arizona, obviously first year coach had a great season as well. That's why he got coach of the year. But Olsenberger really deserved uh, that that title as well after the, the season he had for Iowa State. I like this team. I think they have one of the highest ceilings, uh, but they also do have a pretty yes. deep floor as well. Like it could be as low as ninth in the Big Ten, could be as high as two. That's how deep this that's how deep this uh conference is. I don't know if they're a front runner to win the whole thing. You never know when it comes to conference tournaments, but speaking on regular season, I just don't know if it's gonna be that deep. When you look at their season so far, the start off the year when we just we're getting just to 2022. To finish off the year, we're going to see them in the Invitational against Villanova. A lot of questions about Villanova, what kind of team they're going to be. Can Iowa State uh, obviously capitalize on that one? And then December, we're going to see them face Iowa. Obviously, what a great rivalry that is. Uh, and then we'll see them finish the year or against Baylor to start off Big 12 play. So could get a good idea what we're seeing from the Cyclones. All right, here we go. Our sleeper team. I don't know if this is really considered a sleeper. I think Iowa State might have been our sleeper. But in this case... We're going to give it the TCU. TCU is a team that is given a pretty top 25 ranking. We saw them up there, um, and it's deservingly so. TCU is preseason ranked at four, and like I said, it's deservingly so because with all the transfer portal, pulling away players back and forth, different teams going all over the place. We just talked about Iowa State, and we just talked about um, uh, some other teams that basically are building their starting five off transfers. We don't have that with TCU. They have continuity across the board, and that is something that is really going to help this team out and probably, in my mind, a team that we're going to see sit in the top 25 for the majority, if not the entire year. I think this has a team that can be a ceiling of a top 10, top 15 team at the end of the season once we hit the end of the year, and this is one of those sleeper teams. Again, not sure if we should really call them a sleeper, but this is one of those teams that will run with Baylor, will run with Kansas to battle out at the top of the big 12 once it's all said and done steve yeah well okay my bad on making tcu <laughs> I, I admittedly it's my bad I, I i tried i fought really hard not to get west virginia into this preview i i i, I just can't you it's tried. the same with james yeah I, I i mean i did but then i realized it, you really you you have to look yourself in the mirror the next morning you, you can't do that i love jamie dixon as a coach and you know, we've always heard about like curse of the Bambino and all these other sports curses. I hope Jamie Dixon left a curse so that the University of Pittsburgh bat basketball program is never good again for at least a hundred years. He was treated so poorly by the fan base here in Pittsburgh, and it, it never it never seemed to be enough. And, and he was a magician. He, he put together, you know, competitive rosters with with leftovers and you talk about misfit toys and everything. He always took those kind of rosters and put them together. And there was always continuity. His players maybe weren't good enough to be one and dones or leave after the second year, even after their junior year, they, they stayed for four years. They played as a unit. They grew as a unit. So you sort of had like, well, not really a roller, more, more like a kid's roller coaster with Pitt. And he's doing the same thing at TCU. He's, I think he's had far more success at TCU than he ever had, you know, uh, at Pitt. And that's saying a lot because he, he's, he had a great career coaching at Pitt. But this TCU team, Mike Miles Jr., he's going to be on an NBA roster. You know, he is. Uh, Damian Baugh, complimentary scorer. These guys, again, all system guys. I mean, Miles Jr. is special. And he's uber talented, but yeah. you, but he, he has that partner and ball. Eddie Lampkin, he might be the best front court player come the end of the year in the Big Twelve. He could be. He's a big dude. Yeah, you <laughs> know, and, and yeah, and and he's fearless, and he doesn't seem to make big man mistakes where he's getting himself into foul trouble a lot. I mean, it's hard when you're when you, at that size, you know, especially in a conference like the big 12, it's a very physical conference. So you could see them, but I mean, I think Lamp can talk about ceilings. Yeah. His ceiling is, I mean, he, he, for me, he, if everything goes right and he, he 
gets the most out of his talent, he could be a, a conference player of the year. I, I, that would not surprise me. Anything this TCU team does is not going to surprise me. And this is a team that you really can't control things in a conference tournament. But in the NCAA, when those brackets get announced, I guarantee there's going to be one or two teams that say, oh, damn, I did not want TCU yeah. you know, you know, you know, on our side of the bracket. Yeah, I'm with you. I really do think that's the case. Rounding out that rest of the predicted starting five, and they might be the top two players on the team. I know you covered the guards and, and the big guy, but Emmanuel Miller might be the guy that really runs the show with 10 and a half points per game, six and a half rebounds. I mean, he's probably going to be the guy they really point to. And then Chuck O'Bannon, obviously another really good player. But I think it all starts through the facilitation of Bow and Miles, and I think that that's, they really have a good a, a good call at doing that. We've seen that. They both average almost four to five assists per game. They're going to move the ball around. There's going to be some moments deep in the season when you're really going to see that this team is going to win games because of the experience they have playing with each other, yes. because of not the transfer issues that they had and other teams have. The continuity, I keep saying it, continuity, 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 because we, we're seeing it right now. TCU is going to be one of those teams that stick with the – I guess now it's called quote unquote old fashioned basketball because we're in this new age of transfer portal. They're going to prove that you're going to want to stick with teams. And I think if we see success from them, you might think you might, some of these players might take a step back and say, hang on a minute, maybe we should stick around. I think we're going to see that with TCU this year. I think we're going to see what UVA and the ACC. I wouldn't be shocked if we see both of those teams do very well in the, the national championship bracket not national championship, but March Madness. I wouldn't be surprised if we see them, both those teams go very deep because of that continuity. And TCU really screams that to me. When you look at their schedule to start off 2022, not a crazy November. They do end the month against California at the Emerald Coast Classic and then Big East Big 12 battle against Providence. That's probably their toughest matchup before they get to conference play where they start their conference play at the end of the year on New Year's Eve against Texas Tech. That should be a very good one. Again, this conference is very fun. Again, nine teams. I mean, you could really even say 10. Kansas State could shock us. I just don't know how much I, I just don't really feel that good about Kansas State. I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry to say it. But, um, you know, I've, I've watched this team. They just really haven't had anybody, didn't have any commits. So sorry, Kansas State. But this conference, really, 90% of the teams could completely shine, could be a team that's on the bubble and, and really make some noise. All of the teams in this conference could cause havoc to not only their conference mates but somebody else to hurt their chances them into a bubble team so i'm really excited for the big 12 probably more than any other conference in college basketball this year